Hi, I'm Chirpo. I'm a tech lead, tech coach at NDigital and also a consultancy company in London. And I'm here today to talk about uh, JavaScript and my journey with JavaScript. That's why I call this talk Dear JavaScript. It's like a love letter to the language. So, dear JavaScript, I love you. I hate you. It's not you. It's me. One of the reasons why I love JavaScript, there are many reasons, right? Uh, one of the reasons is because it's a declarative language. It can be a declarative one. So, okay, don't you have your answer? Okay. Shall I wait a bit? Okay. So, number three. Just going to the channel number three. I will try to speak louder anyway. So I was saying that I love JavaScript because it's a declarative language. It can be a declarative one, right? So let's make a comparison with an imperative language. The declarative language in the code tells you the what. With an imperative, it tells you the how. And in general, imperative code is more verbose. Let's make a real life example. If you're going to a bar or in a pub and you want to drink, in an imperative world, basically you will tell the bartender, take a glass from the shelves, put the glass in front of the draft, pull down the handle until the glass is full and pass me the glass. In a declarative way, the bartender knows how to do stuff, so we'll, you can just ask a Coke, please, or a drink in general. So let's make an example with uh, some code. Let's say that you have this function called to lowercase that will accept a collection, um, an array with two, two strings, and you want to lowercase them. In an imperative fashion, what you will do is that you will have a function that basically will accept the, uh, the array, the words. You create a new uh, array, an empty one. Then you loop through the original array. You lowercase each word uh, one at a time, and then you push them in the, in, the new, in the new array. And then you return the new array. In the declarative way, basically, you are not specifying exactly how you to do all the steps. You, just, you can use, for example, a map where that will iterate over all your um, array elements. And then with a callback, you will just lowercase uh, the words. So you can get the same uh, output, but in a different way. And these things in JavaScript also is also influencing libraries and framework. Let's take another example. Let's say that you want a Google map on your, on your website. You, get, you use the Google uh, library. You create a map with all the settings that you need. You can also create a, a marker. And then you, uh, in an imperative way, you you assign the map to the marker. But there are other libraries and frameworks that are, that are using another approach, a more declarative one. Let's take an example, for an example from, from React. So you have a component, basically, where you just tell what you need. All the things that are going behind the scenes, they are not exposed to you. And it's more declarative. Another reason why I really love JavaScript is because it has the REPL, the read, evaluate, print loop. Every time you want to try something, to test something, you can easily do that through a console or a terminal, right? You, and for example, with Node, you can do that easily also in, a, in your Chrome uh, or in your browser console. You can try things, and you're good to go. Sometimes, I, in my daily job, I have people, hey, Chirpo, can I do this? Can I do that? Why don't you try it? It's not because I want, I'm rude. I'm not, usually, but it's because uh, you can easily try on your laptop, and if you try those kind of stuff on your own, things will stick more on your, your mind. It's in a different mindset. And also, another reason is it's like the lingua franca JavaScript, because you can find it everywhere, basically, in every day, on every device, not just on a web page. You can also use it to, for IoT, for robots, and things like that. And also, lots of young kids are uh, approaching coding dojo and programming, thanks also to JavaScript. And probably you all know about this famous uh, the Jeff, uh, Jeff Atwood Lowe, right? That if something can be written in JavaScript, eventually it will be written in JavaScript. The community. So JavaScript is the main language on, 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 on GitHub. It has the most amount of number of uh, repositories and also issues, but that's another story. If you check the survey on Stack Overflow from last year, you can see that JavaScript is the, uh, uh, the language that, is, that lots of people, the, the main one, basically. And even from the platform point of view, 
the three things in this list are Node.js, Angular, and React. So it has a huge impact. So, and like Ben Le Lesh says, that basically you can start building things with JavaScript, right? Without taking care too much about the fundam fundamentals at the beginning. But I hate you in the sense that I used to, at least, because it's true that you can easily start building stuff with JavaScript. You don't have to take care about the fundamentals in order to build some, some stuff. But when shall I start understanding the fundamentals? Where do I start? Ben Lesh, which is uh, one of the core um, team member of Angular and RxJS, says, start with fun. Start curiosity, with curiosity. Eventually, things will, uh, will, uh, will come later. But when? How? So keep in mind that I started at uni with a bit of C. I did a bit of Java. I had also two years of uh, Java commercial uh, experience back in the days. And I did tons of PHP. And I was also a full stack when even full stack wasn't even a, a thing in the year 2000. But I was using a uh, library just to manipulate the DOM. I don't know how many of you remember about uh, Scriptaculous or Prototype.js. Anyone? I'm with you. So, and those languages, C, Java, so the imperative way, the classical object-oriented programming, had a huge influence on me. So I couldn't be expressive and declarative as the example that I show you before since the beginning. Of course, I was also studying, right? I mean, this is one of the books that everyone has. I probably read it four times. So I was grasping the concepts, not with just that book, but still, it wasn't easy for me. So this is a tweet from uh, Kitsa in replying to Dan Abramov. Of course, is, this is a joke, but Dan Abramov is one of the guy behind the, uh, one of the dev behind the re um, Redux. Says I have a huge headache, but I don't know what it is, what it might be. And the other guy is replying, it's JavaScript, of course. So again, I was understanding the underlying concepts, but I couldn't apply them effectively in my code. So I was struggling a bit. Say, why? Is that me? Then if you check Stack Overflow, what are the most frequent questions around JavaScript, those are the same questions that I had five years ago. And they're still, still there. So how do I return a response from an asynchronous call? One million views. How do JavaScript closure work? One million of views. How can I handle a callback error in JavaScript with try catch? There are always these kind of questions. So and even the fact that I was understanding the idea that yeah, JavaScript is non-blocking, it's amazing for the web, you have events, you have a callback async. Yeah, I get that. But I really don't get that that much. But why? Is that me? Maybe or maybe not, because I, was in, I had a huge influence with other kind of architecture and languages, but also because we have a sequential brain. In the sense, consciously, we can do just one thing at a time, right? When you go to the grocery, you have a list of things, one after another. You don't have milk here, uh, eggs here, and stuff like that. So it wasn't easy to, for me at the beginning to read the code and understand how things work. So how many of you have seen these snippets of code? This kind of things is something that you, lots of people are asking you also during interviews, right? What you have here is basically a for loop from 0 to, to 2, and then you create a, um, an async call with set timeout, and inside this uh, async call, you have another function that will basically just output the, the value of i. And the answer is the output will be 3, 3, 3. So at the beginning, I wasn't understanding that. Then I start reading more, trying, starting more to understand it, and say, OK. But what, we, what, what, what was happening is that after two days, or one week, or one month, I was still forgetting on why these things work in that way. We'll probably get to there. So I don't know how many of you know I am developer. Of course, it's another joke. So maybe the new, this new JavaScript framework will compensate the fact that I haven't actually learned JavaScript properly. The thing is that things are moving so fast. And sometimes we don't, we don't think about the fundamentals. And sometimes we get stuck. So another dev replied to the Ben Lesh thread on Twitter saying, yeah, I agree. It's cool that you can start building things straight away.
But at some point, you have to master you have the fundamentals. You have to understand the fundamentals in order to be quicker, more effective. But what are the fundamentals? And when shall I start? That's the question. Because I personally went through a lot of pain. In order to understand fully uh, JavaScript, it took me uh, ages. So it's not you. So it's probably not JavaScript itself that it's the, that it's the, 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 the problem. Because we need to understand how it works. The main problem from my point of view is that either you, you have to-dos and things related to JavaScript, how to build a full application, or you have very specialized talks, books, and it goes very deeply on how the language works. And if you are a beginner or if you just started with a language or in programming, you are a bit stuck because in order to get to the other um, more deep stuff, you need more, more, more knowledge. So first thing, let's start with the event loop. I think many of you know uh, about the event loop. But again, when, when I started and trying to understand the event loop, things were not that clear to me. We know that JavaScript is single-threaded, so it's one process at a time. And one thing is that the event loop itself is the main thread. Everything happens in the event loop. I understand that maybe some of you probably say, hey, Chirpo, but this is a very, a very abstract thing. Yeah, I wanted to keep it abstract, because from my point of view, when, when you start seeing things at the high level, you can go deep in a later stage, but you need a big picture. So the event loop the, is where JavaScript runs, right? The event loop in Node and the event loop in the browser are similar, but not, not the same. So the thing is that the event loop basically executes one thing at a time. So let's go back to this example, the, to the two lower case. So in this case, basically, you have four different function calls. OK? You have the two lower case function they're going to call. You have the map. And two lower case that will be called twice, because we have two elements in the, in, uh, in, the, in the array. So let's think about the stack. You have two lower case. Then the map comes in. Then word to lower case. Once it's done, it returns. And again, word to lower case. Then it returns back. The map is the same. And when we are done, even the stack gets cleared. But as you can see, we are doing, basically, it's like JavaScript is executing four things, so, because it's one thing at a time. And this is one of the things that clicked me. I understand that probably, I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to extensively talk about how all the mechanism behind the scenes. This is just a simplification. But I think this kind of simplification helps beginners, or even when you have to give a quick response to someone that is asking for support on how things work. Another thing is that, yeah, JavaScript is amazing for the web because it's non-blocking. Yeah, but it's not always, not always non-blocking. It's non-blocking for the I.O. And what's the I.O.? The I.O. basically is the idea that when you have a network call, an AJAX request, whatever, and an event loop, uh, sorry, an event in the browser, a file system call, these things, JavaScript is not going to take care of them. It's not even, it's, it's just calling something that will take care about that so it can continue execute the, the next thing. And once you get the result from the NIO call, someone else is going to, let's say, something else is going to push the result again, let's say, in a queue, and then it goes through the event loop. But that's the thing. So one thing at a time, and if it's the I.O. involved, JavaScript is not going to take care of it. But we can block in JavaScript. That's the thing. It's no blocking for the I.O. Let's check these snippets of code. Let's say we have a function that show numbers. Basically, you pass two numbers, a starting number and the ending number. And you just have a while loop where you are increasing the, 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 the from number. Okay? If you call this function with 0 and numbers max safe integer, basically it's a huge number. And then you have a set timeout that will call a function that will print chow on the console after two seconds. If you execute that, it depends on your machine, but on my, on my MacBook Pro, it took 30 minutes before I was able to, uh, to see a chow in the console. So, sorry. So you are blocking. So if it's something that's not related to the I.O., network calls, file system events, et cetera, you are blocking, OK? Because JavaScript is doing one thing at a time, and this is just related to a CPU. It's a CPU bound. It's not an I.O. So 
This is one of my haha moments. Duck is non-blocking only when I/O is involved. So the event loop again. So, but yeah, one thing at a time. But who's taking care of doing these multiple stuff? Because I can can react to an event in the browser, but I can still scroll. Or in Node.js, for example, I know you have a web server. You can still accept incoming connections, right? So there are threads. For example, Node has four threads, but it's also Node.js Node has also the libuv, which is a library that will interact directly with all this I/O stuff. It's not part of JavaScript. Same thing for the for the browser. In the browser, you have, uh, for example, lib event and other threads. So it's more complicated than that. But the idea again that you do one thing at a time, and all the things that are related to I/O are basically offload from from JavaScript is something that you have to keep in mind, and it's something that helped, helped me a lot. So another thing is JavaScript, in the past, didn't know anything about being asynchronous. It was just executing one thing at a time, and the fact that this async behavior was, pro is, was provided by, by these other things that were running outside the event loop. But we know that now we have promises, right? And as we know, promises are always async. So they had to put something inside the language in order to uh, have this notion of asynchrony, asynchronicity. So, and so that's why you have in the language, you have jobs and jobs queues, like mini event loop. Unfortunately, we can't use it nowadays. It's like an abstraction inside the, inside the language. But yeah, so just to give you an idea on the fact that previously JavaScript wasn't the Async in the sense that didn't know anything about asynchronous programming. The scoping, even here, you know, that maybe more, lots of you knows about this, uh, but it's just uh, an overview in order to connect the dots. Because one of my problems was that I wasn't able to, I was under, trying to understand how this thing works, how that thing works, but I wasn't able to connect all the dots properly. Scoping, in JavaScript, scope refers to the current context of your code. Each function creates its own execution context. And that's the key. Let's, let's take a, a closer look with the snippets of code. For example, you, have, you are importing a module. It can be in Node. It could be even a, on the browser with import and things like that. So you have a scope. Let's call it scope A. Then you have a function B. Inside the function B, you have another scope. And this is very important because a function it will create a new scope. But at the same time, the scope B will have access to scope A. And then you have a number variable, right? Then you have another function C that basically will create another scope. But function C will have access to uh, scope B and scope A, and so on and so forth. So it seems quite uh, easy now. But again, if you think that you are, if you are coming from another language, and if you are working with many different languages, these are the kind of things that people at the beginning don't think about. But this is how JavaScript works. And, and on, in order to leverage all the potentials, these are very, very um, important concepts. So one of the things that happens frequently, this is, I've seen these things with other languages. For example, people that were moving from Java, PHP to Go. First thing that they want to implement is a dependency injection container because they think that's the best practice, that's the best thing to do, right? But languages are different. And even in JavaScript, you usually don't need a dependency injection container, because you can leverage it with a scope thing. This is one of the, the reasons. So again, you have a Neven loop. You have the scoping, so one thing at a time, a scoping. And then what I, what I understood is that a function basically is always running in isolation. So it's like a small program that is running by itself. It doesn't know anything about the other functions. What it knows is about the, 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 the scope, in the sense that if, you are, if, the, if the scope C wants to access things from the scope B, it, it, there will be a, a reference to that. And that's the, uh, that's the execution context. But from the code point of view, you as developer, you read things one after another. But how things work in JavaScript, basically, those kind of things will be executed independently. That's why some people sometimes say that, JavaScript can be a concurrent language, because being able to run isolated processes, isolated stuff, is the key of uh, concurrency. So I was starting understanding things a bit better. So let's get back to this example. So let's connect the dots. 
So in this case, you have the variable i, which is accessible also from the, the, the inner function, right, where we are outputting things. But JavaScript does one thing at a time. So we'll do the for loop, and after at least 100 milliseconds, it will start executing the other functions. But the other function will, will have the access to i, which is basically changed during that time, because it's just a reference, OK? So this is our, if you understand these snippets of code, you understand most of the things that are related to JavaScript. Event loop, scoping, and then function. We already talked about functions so, uh, a bit so far. Functions are first-class citizens. You can return a function from a function, pass a function as an argument to a function. Beautiful stuff. But at the beginning, I said, OK, so, so what? How can I use this? Is this meaningful? Or the fact that functions are objects in JavaScript. OK, so, so what? The fact that functions are objects, when I've seen this example, the fact that you have a function, hello, doesn't do anything crazy. You have an argument. And you can use the dot length, so a property on an object, on a function, and it returns one. What's this one? It's basically the length is the number of arguments that you, can pass, you pass to a function. So zero argument, you will get zero, two arguments, two, and so on and so forth. But another thing that clicked me a lot, clicked me in, in, my, in my brain was functions are callable objects. If you have this function, and instead of calling hello, open, close, parentheses, you just call hello in a method called call, you get the same results. So those are the kind of things, small stuff, that helps you, from my point of view, helps you a lot at the beginning when you are trying to understand how JavaScript works. We're not going too much into details again, but those are small bits that can be easily connected to each other and will, keep, will help a lot beginners uh, to move forward with the language without being stuck with a, always with a framework or a library. Another thing is that function in JavaScript, even when I discovered that, uh, retur returns undefined. A function always returns something if you are not implicitly returning something in the bundle the function. It always returns undefined. That's why also when the first times that I was trying things in the console, in the terminal, I said, oh, shit, it's undefined. Maybe there's an error. No, it's totally fine. And that's why you can do this kind of tricks in JavaScript, right? So you have console log, doesn't return anything. It will return undefined. Then you use a nor lo uh, use a logic or, and you, do, you call a function. This will work. Why? Because undefined is a falsy value. So it, basically, it will execute the second thing. But at the same time, it will execute the console log. Talking about, speaking about uh, Dan Abramov again, he posted this thing on, uh, on, um, on Twitter two, yeah, almost two years ago, one year and a half ago. There are two snippets. Uh, these two snippets are different. You have an object with a method, you call it, and then you, have, you assign that method without calling it to a variable, and then you call that variable. Learn why and you understand JavaScript. Of course, this example was also taking care of, um, was also related how, about the this in JavaScript, but we are not talking about that today. But even these things coming from another language, coming from PHP, Java, whatever, I couldn't really understand that. Oh, it's an object, that's the instance. Forget about the instance. Basically, let's say that we have this example. You have an object called friendly bot that has a method like say hello. It will console log, it's, it's going to wave. If you assign the, uh, the function to a, to a variable and you will call it, you will get the same result. So basically, what it's doing is that like copy and paste the code. I understand probably it's a bit too. Uh, simplistic, but these things help a lot people to move forward and maybe later to try to understand how things deeply works. You can pass a function name as an argument. This is another example. You have a collection with three numbers, and you want to get a square root of those numbers. You use map, you cycle through that, and then you say, okay, I'm having a callback, a function that will be applied to each element. Map is always passing uh, the element uh, of, of, of the array to the callback. And then I will call the, the, the math square root of that function, uh, sorry, of, for on that number. But this and this are the same. The difference is that we were wrapping another callback, and it wasn't, 
it's somehow useless in the sense that basically the, the input are the input from the map and, and map square root are the same. So you can easily do that. One of the things that I see a lot of time that was doing that at the beginning as well is that when you have promises, promise then, and sometimes people instead of putting just the the function name, we're calling already the function, right? Like do something, open close. So and I get that because sometimes it's not that easy to shift paradigms coming from other languages where you are more imperative. Now, nowadays, I see a lot of people writing uh, either creating a function this way. You, create a, you assign a function to a variable. Otherwise, you can just simply use functions. I don't know, maybe it's more, a more nipster way than the first one. But usually, I tend to use the second one because it's more explicit. But lots of people don't understand the difference between the two. They think they are equivalent, but they are not. Because in the first case, it's in a function expression, and it's only defined when that line is reached. In the other case, it's a function declaration, and basically it's defined as soon as its surrounding function or script are executed. Okay, Once you pass your app.js file or whatever, uh, this thing will be evaluated immediately. It's defined immediately. Another thing is, now we have classes in JavaScript. And I don't know if it was a mistake or not. It's debatable. It is going to help a lot, probably, in some scenarios. I can see that in React, they are using that extensively. And it's fine. But we know that, basically, JavaScript is not a classical object-oriented programming. It's a prototypical one. And the thing is that if you have class person and you check the type, what do you get at the end? Function, again. So. Connecting all the dots, the event loop, one thing at a time, a function is like a JavaScript execute one thing at a time is, with a, is like a mini application with all the surrounding context. And, you, and, and then how function works, basically you can, can probably now easily answer all these kind of questions, especially the last one. Why can't you strike catch? Well, simply because if you think about it, Every function gets executed in isolation. So if you have two functions or a callback, basically they, they don't have this visibility to one another. Um, so it's me. Or I probably should say it's us. Because again, I think it's also our responsibility if we are, let's say, experienced developers, or if we really understand JavaScript, to give a better guidance. I can't say that I was alone at the beginning, but sometimes, you know, I, I say, why I don't understand this? Maybe it's me. Or maybe, I don't know, there's not enough things on, on the web that I will explain in, a, in an easier way or that can give us a big picture of things. Let's talk about curring, right? We said that a function can return a function. Fine, cool. But what's the idea behind it? So one of the things that you see online and talks and stuff like that is that, yeah, I can create an add function with accepted number that will return another function with another number, and then I can just return the sum of, of, of them. So I can basically create a, a partial function, let's say, uh, add2, which basically every time I will call add2 with, a, with any number, in this case 3, I will get 5. Wow, that's cool. But how many times shall I, will I do that in my code on a daily basis? I never did that. So these are the kind of things that I think we should take the responsibility in order to simplify stuff to people, at least to beginners. So um, I don't think this example is uh, useful enough. At least I think I'm, I'm a kind of person that, ha in order to understand things, I need to see them in a practical way. So from my point of view, a better example would be, OK, let's say that you have this function, convert. You want to convert from one currency to another one. So you specify the, the, the initial currency, the, the second currency, and the amount. Then you, can, you get the rate from a config file, or even better, from an asynchronous call, whatever, where you can get the exact rate. And then you return the final amount. Then you can call it like this, right? But let's say that getting the rate is an expensive operation somehow. We could do this. We could use convert that will return a function where we specify the amount. 
And given the fact that you have the scoping thing, so you have a reference, I don't have every time to recalculate the rate, to ask for the rate. And I can, build in, in a beautiful way, in a more declarative way, an expressive way, create a function called convert pound to euro, where I just pass at the beginning the two, um, the two currency. And then every time I want to convert an amount, I will just basically pass the amount that I need to convert. Or another example where I use current function is that let's say that you are debugging or you are cleaning your log system and you want to apply a label to, to some labels to the different part of the, your logging system. It's fine. I could just use do console log, first string and second string. But what if I want to name my logger? I have Redis, for example. I can just create a function that will accept the label and we return another function with a message. And every time, and then I will create a, a variable that will basically point to that function. So I can easily just do Redis log and as many times as I want, and I'll be sure that I will always have that label because for the scoping, the reference, another thing is that in order to, be, to support other people, the best thing will be always try to check the documentation on MDN, Mozilla Developer Network. Because for many reasons, you can contribute to that. It's very well detailed and has better examples. So every time you search something on Google, please prepend MDN in order to get the, the results. And it's there I discovered these things. So JavaScript is, has a simple, uses a simple data structure. And that's why it's also powerful from my point of view. It already has this method like, on an array, you have filter, map, reduce, sum, and every. But I don't see that much people using them. But it's not just because we have to be functional, right? It's always because we want to be more expressive, okay, more declarative, okay, as we said at the beginning. And it's about JavaScript power. It's about embracing the language in an idiomatic way. Because at the end of the day, uh, this is another famous quote. Any fool can write code that works, but only good programmers write code that humans can understand. Code is for us. It's not for the machine. So if you can be expressive, you can embrace the language, it will be better. So again, the main message here is that, from my point of view, where's the, here you have the question mark. So we are still missing something. In a sense, either we have good resource on how to build stuff with JavaScript, or we have this awesome book that also changed my life, which is you don't, uh, you don't Know JavaScript by Kyle Simpson. But there's still something in the middle, from my point of view, that is missing. Something that will say, OK, this is how JavaScript roughly works. Also because the language is changing so, so fast, right? But the building blocks are always the same. Event loops, scoping, and functions. And even Gettify, uh, Kyle Simpson, the author of uh, the author of You Don't Know JavaScript basically um, says that he also has, sometimes still has uh, hard times writing the code. So it's totally normal. But we need to also help each other. So from my point of view, one of the takeaways is that if you are a beginner, find a mentor. Because it's fine to read stuff online, uh, books, uh, going to conferences. But what helped me a lot is was having some people around me say, hey, maybe in the middle of the night or while having a, a drink, Hey, but how these things work? Because maybe you, you, know, you are more comfortable, you don't, have, you don't feel the pressure, so you can eat friendly ask stuff. If you can't find a mentor, find a buddy, because I'm sure that lots of people, even today, still has issues with, uh, with JavaScript. And if you can support, be a mentor. And if you are a mentor, provide simple and clear guidance. I know that it's, it's not that easy, because to simplify things, which is part of our main job, by the way, every day, is not that easy. But if we stop using examples like the curling with the add function, and maybe we provide some real use cases, it will, uh, it will help a lot. So these are, for example, one of my mentors and one of my mentees as well. And it's super important also to, it's not just thanks to the mentors that uh, I became, um, uh, become, become better and better every day, but it's also thanks to the mentee, because when you try to explain stuff to people that don't understand, if you are able to simplify um, um, the, your, your answer, you will, you will be basically more confident with, with, with the language, with what you are 
with what you are trying to, to teach. And at the same time, sometimes you discover things that you ne ne never realized just because uh, a beginner will, uh, uh, will ask you those questions. So again, dear JavaScript, I love you, I hate you, it's not you, it's me, or probably it's better to say it's us. Thank you so much. I'm Chirpo. You can find me on Twitter as Chirpo, or you can write me an email. As I said, I am a, lead, a tech lead coach at Den Digital in London. We are hiring, surprisingly. So if you want a job opportunity or want to discover more, just come and talk to me after the talk. Thank you.